All right. I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, uh, a.k.a. Some Gadget Guy, which is the SGG of this terribly named podcast series. But the QA is the important part, which obviously stands for question and answer. So we like to make these interactive conversations. I'm already seeing an incredible an incredible lineup here in the live chat. Otaku, Al Spockley, Gormlord just finished watching Star Trek The Next Generation, and he's looking what to go watch next. Uh, some recommendations for DS9, Voyager. Um, you could also, if you want to see like more 90s cornball space opera, you could check out Babylon 5. I'm going through, I, I just finished the first season rewatch of Babylon 5, just as something to have on in the background, and forgot you know how much of a shift it went from like monster of the week to continuing anthology series um but yes i uh, th we're 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 in for a banger of a show today a slightly different format because we've got something that's kind of fun i uh, recently on the on my youtube channel i i put up a photo comparison of low light photos between the one plus nine and the galaxy s21 now, there's this claim and this repeated truism that somehow the OnePlus 9 camera is not good enough for the money. It's crippled. Who, who could imagine uh, a phone in the premium tier without OIS? This is just pants on head crazy. How dare OnePlus make a device like this? But I'm not seeing a lot of practical comparisons. So... I put it up against a phone that's similarly priced, Galaxy S21, OnePlus 9. And today, um, oh, oh, I put out this video. I didn't label the phones. Um, I didn't tell you which phone was which because that is a cheap way to guide your audience to the conclusion that you want them to have. So I've got lots of complaining. I've got lots of this, lots of yap, 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 yap. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Not a lot of people voted, though. So instead of me telling you which phone was which, I said, hey, if OIS is crippling this camera, or the lack of OIS is crippling this camera, tell me which phone was which. And no one could. <laughs> so I feel like, again, I, I feel like I need techies to just calm down a bit. You know, just, just take a step back. And uh, instead of just repeating the thing that you heard from another YouTuber Maybe look at the people that are practically trying to compare this kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to go through all the results of of that showdown in the second half of this podcast. Um, and then we've got news. We've got NFT news. We've got Discord news. We've got YouTube news. We've got uh, FCC news. This is going to be a banger of a show. I'm feeling real good about this show. Just right at the top, um, I got to say... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know when I'm going to hit my wall. Uh, I, I got my second uh, my second 5G upgrade um, over the weekend. So I, I posted a picture of getting the shot, and uh, I'm kind of freaked out by needles, but went really smooth. Everything was great. Yesterday, spent almost all day in bed. I mean, it it, it was my, – my arm is still a little stiff. Um, it kind of laid me out. Um, it was a, it was a, just a bit rougher than my first shot was, um, Moderna gang, woo, FTW. So I'm feeling pretty good right now and I'm on a massive mug of coffee, but we might get to like 45 minutes in and then just watch me like fade. <laughs> so hopefully I can sustain the whole show here and we'll see how it goes. Oh, King Turtle is part of the Pfizer gang. Uh, if we now that we're we're vaccinated and we've got our immunities, we can dance fight like West Side Story, Moderna versus Pfizer. Moderna versus Pfizer. <laughs> when you're Pfizer, you're Pfizer. I can't I was going to try and make it fit the when you're a jet, you're a jet all the way. I, I I'm not that musically talented. Woof. And McCorkerin, I got my first Moderna. I'm getting my first uh, Moderna tomorrow at Gillette Stadium. Nice. Good job. Uh, Mr. Malignance is also a part of Pfizer gang, so kind of ganging up on me here. Um, and Simon says, Hypno, the first shot laid me up for four days. So the first shot hit me pretty hard. 
Um, but it was it was kind of like a one day turnaround. Like I was sore the day I got it. I was really stiff and achy the day after, and then I was pretty much fine. Second shot, um, uh, my wife even said like you're feeling a little warm. You're you're and and I was way achier than I was on the first shot. And then I woke up this morning and I'm still a little stiff and I'm still a little achy, but it feels like this is lingering a bit more than my first shot. Everyone's biology is going to have a different reaction to that, but I'm, I'm excited to see, especially more people in these, in this chat and these uh, comments getting their shots. Uh, people that are, these are the baby steps that we're going to take to figuring out what our new normal is going to look like. The Loki Ted is also Pfizer crew. Oh no, I'm surrounded. <laughs> King Turtle. Juan joined the club of everyone getting their 5G antennas into their arms. So so now Bill Gates can finally track me in addition to the two phones that I keep in my pockets all the time and my smartwatch, which has GPS. Now I'm trackable. <laughs> Nick Fell. Woof. I got someone backing me up. Team Moderna. All right. Let, let's get into some housekeeping and uh, let, let's get into the show. Like I said, in the gadget block, I am so excited to share the results of this photo test because I feel like when when we leave it up to the reviewer to spell out which phone is which, it's very easy to rig a comparison. But whenever we put up just a blind taste test, the results are all over the place. And I love it when reviewers are always trying to jump through hoops to try and make the most popular phones win. But then when, you know, Folks just get a chance to see photo after photo with no commentary forcing their opinion. This landscape is a lot more competitive than we're pretending that it is because of one feature here or one spec there. So um, a, a part of that commentary was really heavy um, in, in my videos and, and in my uh, podcasts over this last week. So first, um, the, the, the video that we're going to be talking about was one of the major videos that I put out last week. Whoops. <laughs> That's one of the photos we're going to take a look at. Um, my OBS is all totally different for all of the photo and video samples. I'm probably going to make a few more mistakes like that. Uh, starting off, is the OnePlus 9 camera crippled? No OIS? Question mark. Let's compare. And this is the video that obviously I was talking about where... Two people got close, but no one got the right ballot. It's five photos, phone A, phone B. They're not the same for every photo. And uh, I'm, I'm really stoked. I'm really stoked to talk about that. Next up, this was a major video for the OnePlus 9 Pro, where I finished the camera conclusion. The This is the... Um, so what I've started doing... Uh, dope, did it again. I have muscle memory for where where the my web browser sharing is supposed to be and now it's all totally wrong i might need to move that this is going to get silly um one plus nine pro is the hasselblad hype worth it so here's the deal um the the full camera deep dive is a patreon exclusive and that's a 40 minute video uh but obviously in one of my videos you can always count on like I don't know, eight minutes of me being cranky about the state of reviewing. Um, I, I feel like every time I just put out commentary saying, hey, this is these were my experiences and this is what's good about the phone. I am met with a deluge of, oh, but this other phone's better and this other reviewer said this and this other reviewer said that. So if I don't come out aggressive, cutting all of those crap regurgitated arguments off at the knees, then my comments are full of Sam Apple shills. I don't want my comments full of Sam Apple shills. I want my comments full of people that are actually looking at the data that I'm supplying, and then we can have a conversation. Each video is supposed to be the start of a conversation. So if anyone's getting sensitive about how often I'm going after bad reviewing trends, then I really need you to take a look at why are you defending bad reviewing trends? If you're not a bad reviewer, come join the main part of the conversation. If you are a bad reviewer, maybe take stock of why you're reviewing products the way you are and maybe join a conversation that's a little bit broader and a little bit more nuanced. Um, what I've started doing instead of just doing the conclusion part, which is the very first section of each one of my camera deep dives, 
I've started including some of my performance results too. So even though the camera conclusion misses the main, the middle 20 minute chunk of the individual photo analysis and video analysis and all of the test setups that I perform, um, there's still more conversation happening on the phone performance, on my thoughts, kind of summing up my experiences using the camera. There's still more commentary there than you'll mostly get in any other phone review. Um, so I feel pretty good about that. The camera conclusions kind of stand on their own. And then if you want, you can go through photo by photo with me and really look at the deep dive stuff over on patreon.com slash some gadget guy. And then uh, lastly, I don't run a lot of contests. Um, I really don't like contest junkies. Someone who follows a social media account or, or watches a YouTube video just to get free stuff can miss me. I really have very little patience or respect for people that are on the internet just with grabby hands the whole time, and they are exhausting to deal with. And then if you build up your channel or your audience on too many contests, then people just get demanding about how much stuff you're not giving them, or you're not doing contests in the right regions. Or then you have to, you know, like maybe something doesn't ship exactly when you thought it could ship and then you've got to handle all of that back end the amount of time it takes to really run a contest is not just putting up a contest post and then shipping out a product it's a huge amount of back end work but i'm also wanting to do a series of phone challenges ways that we can encourage people to do more things with their phones and and really try to spread the word on some advanced use that consumers can still access, you know, something that you didn't think you could do with your phone, but this is an exciting way to get more bang for your gadget buck. And the first thing that I, I really, I mean, it spoke to me, I'm an audio guy. I, I've spent most of my life recording human voices and capturing conversations and interviews and podcasts. And I wanted that to be a part of the very first phone challenge. And so uh, on somegadgetguy.com, I, I am hosting a challenge to record a podcast of your, of your life over the last year. This can be a podcast or an interview. Our memories are precious. Um, they're more valuable than social media points. Years from now, you're going to want to look back on what life was like over this last year. And a lot of it's going to be gone. Like your memory just can't hold on to quarantine conditions. And now's the right time. You know, like I just got my second shot. We're starting to figure out what's going to happen next. So if, if you had some kind of magical device that was an insanely powerful compute platform that, you know, had good apps for, I don't know, recording audio. Oh, you know what you would need? Not just the good app, but also microphones built into it. You know, something that was built for a lot of communication use, like phone calls or video calls. But then you could also use those mics to, to like capture and record speech. Because, you know, you don't want to have to go out and buy like a memo recorder or, or a portable handy recorder or something like that. If only some kind of magic device like that existed. <laughs> oh, well, I guess we'll just never be able to do that. <laughs> Dave Burns, some audio guy. Yeah, some audio guy is, is a lot snarkier and meaner and meaner than some gadget guy is. I don't let him out very often anymore. Um, and Dave Burns is absolutely correct. The mics on the OnePlus 9 Pro are so good. So that's the challenge. Can you record a podcast or an interview about what your life was like over the last year? And I know, I mean, the obvious choice, like Al Spockley is saying, you know, like, I'm hoping for selective amnesia of 2020 and 2021. Um, a lot of this was spurred on because, yeah, there's a lot of not good stuff that I'm not looking to hold on to so tight. Um, I feel like we'll have pretty good documentation of all the things that went wrong over 2020 and 2021. What I'm worried about are all the good moments that get lost in the blur of day-to-day -day life when most of us were in some kind of shelter in place or quarantined conditions. And the story that I tell in this video is I can't remember my 16th wedding anniversary. It's gone. Like the day is gone. And and we're re we really looked through phones and through uh, social media posts and like I have no idea what we did that day. 
So I want I want something. So I want to do something that kind of encourages people to document. You, you've got this amazing tool to archive your family memories and to preserve your family history. It's in your pocket right now. So let's use it. Let, let's do that. So the 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 reason why I'm kind of explaining this a bit more and why I started with that whole thing about contests is uh, my friends at Rode Microphones are also hooking up one of their little video mics. So I'm a huge audio nerd. I've done work with Rode Microphones for 20 years now as alternatives to some of my favorite, you know, like Sennheisers and Neumanns and Audio-Technicas. Rode has been pound for pound um, right in the mix in terms of high quality recording solutions. I worked at a voiceover casting facility that was stocked entirely with Rode microphones. We were, we were cutting great voiceover audio. And so they're hooking up a little Rode video mic, me C, the USB C version of the mic that I'm holding right here. And that's an international giveaway. Rode is going to send the mic out whenever we, uh, we decide on the contest winner, you've got a week left and my contests heavily reward participation. So, you know, you go to a Gleam leak, link, <laughs> gleam.io, um, you get one entry for following on social media, you get one entry for, you know, looking at a Facebook page, all that stuff is pretty standard. If you participate on the challenge and you send me a, a podcast link, then you get 500 entries. <laughs> You've, you've got to, it's got to be a link that can actually play some audio but if you want to win and you participate and you take this challenge legit you will get like 10 entries for all of the social media stuff you'll get 500 entries for recording your podcast i really want someone who participates to win <laughs> I, I, I heavily want to reward participation and I'm hoping that for future phone challenges, like I want to do a gaming challenge. I want to do a writing challenge. I want to do a video challenge. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that I can also add, you know, like maybe we can hook up like a little prize here or a little prize there. I mean, nothing so major that it, it, it but just something to kind of encourage, you know, something to kind of sweeten the deal to, to, to help folks kind of get over this hurdle of, oh, but that's hard to do from a phone, so I shouldn't participate. Um, I feel like the giveaways and stuff, they kind of help. So, and then also I, I, I'm hoping we can branch this out. Like if other folks, other reviewers, other influencers are interested in hosting a challenge of their own, anyone who wants to take this conversation seriously, I'm game to do some collaborations. Like I, I had a couple, uh, you know, back and forths in the in the comments on this video with Peachy, um, over technically speaking, and uh, if he wants to host a challenge, I really want to point some attention his way for getting more use out of a phone. And again, I I, I feel like someone like Scott would take that pretty seriously too. So, um, oh, hey, we got Tech Tech Potato in the house. We got Gary the Fireman, Lanny82, Hickey85, Kids911. Uh, I'm missing some. Uh, Barry Johnson, what's up? That's awesome. Excellent. Uh, this is Martin across the podcast. All right. We've got a full crew. Um, oh, and then also TK and I did our Thursday stream. I uh, definitely want to give that a chat because I feel like we covered Apple and the M1 products a little bit deeper than what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about that a little bit in the gadget block. I feel like getting almost a week on, the the conversation or the commentary surrounding the new iPads and the new iMacs and the new AirTags has been well exhausted. <laughs> but there's still a few things that I feel like we should, we should chat out um, because I feel like there's a philosophy happening with the iPad that is actually really interesting to follow. So we'll, we'll be covering that too. Matt Tyler, a gaming challenge I'm in. If you host a gaming challenge, I'll 100% help out with that. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, oh, and Gary, the fireman dropping some, dropping some tier one subs here. Uh, Gary is hooking up Chris 2904, Rami Vaden, Mike, it happened, Braden and Barry Johnson tier one subs. Thank you so much, man. Again, always super appreciated when folks are helping to support production on this channel and everyone give a little wave to tech love and mama join in the chat here too. Gary, that's super awesome. And again, always super, always greatly appreciated. Um, 
helping out and and spreading the word and supporting so um that's housekeeping uh, all of the uh, the stories all of the links everything that we're going to be talking about today is, is going to be available on the show notes for this week's episode on some uh yeah let's let's knock out some news so that we can uh we can kind of get onto the gadget block now um some of these stories are are actually two of these stories are more follow-ups um i i didn't cover this when it originally launched um but the fcc sort of got over um i i it, i don't know what terminology to describe this with the fcc set up a nationwide short phone number for a suicide prevention hotline and that short code is 988 so like if you know you want to call emergency medical you call 911 the FCC is, is approved for phone calls 988 as a suicide prevention hotline. Now, if you know anything about our government, our telecommunications industry, and a regulatory body like the FCC, additional changes should be easy, but the process of actually enacting them requires that bureaucratic approach of you know, proposing it, opening it up for commentary, examining the ramifications of it, and then implementing that strategy so this this story is one one step into the process of turning this feature on but this is written up by the verge um mitchell clark the fcc wants your thoughts on improving the shorter national suicide prevention lifeline number um, the federal the fcc has decided to look into letting people text the upcoming shortened national suicide prevention lifeline number in a bid to increase accessibility and use the service by those who need it most. Last May, the FCC approved the creation of a new short code 988 that will act as an easy to remember phone number for the lifeline. Um, it's worth noting that today's approval is just a first step, and that doesn't mean that people will for sure be able to text the 988 number when it goes live in July of 2022. So here's, here's one of the things that especially for those of you who are a bit more politically minded you're you're willing to engage with a government agency like the fcc share your thoughts um participate i feel like this is such an, an easy and simple a tangible benefit for improving the infrastructure of, of and the functionality of something like the 988 short code that if someone is in help, if someone needs help, if someone is in danger, if someone is a danger to themselves, the idea of dialing 988 and, and, and hoping to connect on a phone call when maybe the immediacy of a text message would work better, to me, is a no-brainer. But again, we're talking about government function here. So today, they've approved the next step of asking for comments and looking at the viability of allowing people to text 988. And that's where we're at. So uh, if anyone here is, is, is likely to contribute to something like this, I feel like this is, this is an easy one. <laughs> this is an easy way to join the political conversation or the political discussion and send some thoughts to the FCC. Uh, for me personally, obviously I'm, I'm in full support of this. I, I feel like if we're already going to do the work, the laying the ground and the infrastructure of allowing people to call 988 as a suicide prevention hotline, then why not go the extra step and, and at its inception, include the ability to also text that number? Someone might feel differently. I, I don't know why they would, but this to me is, is, is a pretty straightforward one. This one's pretty easy. Uh, sadly, yeah, Dave Burns, this seems like a Parks and Rec town hall meeting waiting to happen. But but again, it, it's funny, like the people who are most motivated to contribute to the FCC commentary, uh, aside from Russian bots, which we saw during Ajit Pai's uh, reign as the FCC chair, um, yeah, those comments actually weigh on the process here. Uh, you know, it's so easy to be discouraged in the grand political conversation, uh, when, when you see so many media outlets and so many opportunities for joining a conversation kind of get squashed by really ugly messaging. 
but we actually do have a pretty solid history of of overwhelming support for good policy impacting how that policy is implemented. And again, I would point back to the Tom Wheeler days of the FCC where the OIO fell apart and under a, 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 a significant amount of uh, citizen commentary, Tom Wheeler kind of pivoted on the stance for net neutrality. And that's laid the groundwork, that laid the framework for the, you know, the, the net neutrality that was passed during the Obama administration. The, those, those comments mattered. Um, when they saw that people were willing <laughs> to deal with commenting on the FCC website at the time and, and calling the FCC switchboards. So, again, I, I feel like we, we too often sort of shrug or it doesn't matter or there's no point. And we've got a lot of data to suggest that that's not true. Um, sometimes it sucks, but sometimes we actually do push policy in the direction we want it to go. And this is, an, again, like I said, this one I think is an easy one. <laughs> so, um, and, and also kudos to The Verge for covering that part of the story. I think they were the one of the main outlets. It was like them and Politico um, that were early on that story. Uh, follow up to another story that we were talking about a couple weeks back. I want to say it was about two weeks back. Um, we, we, I was very concerned about uh, Discord getting bought by Microsoft. Now, to be fair, I got a bit of pushback in the comments and, uh, and a few DMs um, on, on my concerns there where like, hey, if anyone was going to buy Discord, maybe it's better that Microsoft bought them. And, you know, pointing to things like, you know, Xbox and Game Pass and the way that Microsoft has crafted, like, really solid uh, community tools for gamers. And so uh, better than if Discord were bought by Google or Discord were bought by Amazon. Totally fair. I think that's that's totally fair to call me out on me being concerned about Discord going with Microsoft. But... It would seem that my concerns over Microsoft buying them were a little were a little uh, early. Um, <laughs> I burned that energy because now Discord has end has ended their acquisition talks with Microsoft. This was written up by Taylor Soper over at GeekWire. Uh, Microsoft's bid to buy Discord is over for now, at least. The Wall Street Journal reported Tuesday that the popular chat startup has ended acquisition talks with the Redmond Washington tech giant and other and others and others after reports surfaced last month that Discord was in final negotiations about a sale for at least ten billion. So uh, th this is an interesting position that we're in. Ultimately, when I start really enjoying a, a certain type of platform or a private platform, a new developer has popped up, a new service is created. And we see these loops kind of time and time again, you know, where Clubhouse made a big splash and now Twitter has completely replicated the Clubhouse business model. And I haven't been on Clubhouse in a while, but I've been peeking in on some of the Twitter uh, town hall style conversations that are being hosted. Um, Discord is in a very unique position where they're not trying to compete against Zoom. Uh, they're not trying to make another Teams or Meet or work collaboration platform, but the tools included are just as competitive, but the focus is on more of a community or, or, or more of a gamer focus. So there's something really interesting happening there. Now, the danger is, so again, the, the reason why I bring that up is, I, I would prefer to see an entity target its audience, even if that audience is niche, but do the best job that they can, find their own avenues to profitability, and work on making the best product for that community that they can. And I think that there's room for success there. Maybe it's not as exciting, maybe it's not as sexy as like, we could be the next Zoom, or we could beat Zoom at their own game. Obviously, there are conversations happening in boardrooms right now about how to make a something killer, and that's kind of lame. If someone's already there first, you're just going to be an also-ran unless you can do something radically disruptive. So now, the question is, is how does Discord sort of maintain profitability, you know, live up to the valuation where people are throwing around numbers like 10 billion dollars 
So the people that might have invested or might have built Discord are going to have expectations on a return. And there has been some rumbling that if they don't get bought, maybe what they should consider is an IPO. And so if they go public, that's a different kind of concern. Like what is Discord's business model going to be? How are they going to be profitable? And I would like to see Discord stay solo, but I also have some concerns about what that might mean for how they monetize this product. So we'll have to see. This is an ongoing story. We're going to have to keep following it because I was a little late to the Discord game and now I flip and love it. So now, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm anxious that if Discord stays solo but drastically changes up their business model, that it won't be the service that I really like. And from Nick Fell, I'd note that it's kind of inevitable that Discord gets bought. As far as I know, they hemorrhage money. As just like, uh, just like other free social media services, it's hard to monetize. Th that's, again absolutely in line with why I would be a little anxious about an IPO is is uh, seeing Discord do something that drastically changes up their business model. But at the same time, again, it's I feel like so many of these services are at the tail end of the of the last phase of the internet. Make something disruptive, work fast, break things, put everything out for free, and then try and figure out monetizing after it's cool. And I feel like younger and younger audiences are, are super hip to that. And instead, they're going to be looking at future services that are much clearer and much more upfront about how they monetize. And and maybe it's a subscription fee. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a payment plan. Maybe it's you know, cosmetics or emotes. I mean, again, it, it, there, the money needs to be exchanged so that companies can keep the servers on. But if the the bulk of that conversation happened first with, uh, you know, w get in on this platform for free and then we'll figure out money, I, I really think investors are starting to are starting to shy away from that being the only business plan that's viable in Silicon Valley. All right. So next up, this is a quick little story. Um, I, I just like pointing stuff like this out because, you know, for example, um, in, in many markets across the United States, depending on your ISP, you, you might start seeing data caps. You know, uh, your internet plan and your home internet plan might start getting more expensive as Comcast flips on data caps and throttles you and, oh, well, you went over, so now we've got to charge you extra for the data that you used when really it... it, it it's a predatory business practice when you've got monopolistic markets. So little things like this, getting the word out, I feel are are benefits, especially to the people that are already under data caps or might soon need to change their family internet behavior. Um, uh, YouTube has made some changes to their YouTube player, uh, adding even more video resolution controls and options on mobile. Uh, this was written up by Damian Wild over at 9to5Google. If you're frustrated by the level of control offered by the YouTube mobile app with regard to video resolution, then the addition of even more precise options will be very welcome. And so when you go into your YouTube settings now, you've got the ability to craft what kind of quality you want on which networks. And this, to me, is, is one of the nice uh, considerations. Um, so let's say you are on your cell phone plan, you can set a different threshold for video quality than if you are on Wi-Fi. And so if you're on metered data on any platform, on your cell phone plan or on your home internet connection, uh, I don't think anyone's going to be upset about some additional changes. You know, for example, uh, yeah, most of my YouTube viewing is in split screen. So what I love to do is take a tall, skinny phone and dock YouTube to the upper quarter of that screen and then use the lower three quarters for the rest of whatever I want to do on that phone. And I've just got kind of YouTube as its own little uh, uh, its own little section docked. I don't really like picture in picture. I think that's dumb. So if my YouTube viewing is only one quarter of a 1080p display, I don't need a 1080p stream ever. 
on my phone. So if I were using meter data and I were leaving it up to YouTube to do auto quality and maybe it was, you know, jumping from 480 to 720, I probably don't need 720, you know, I, I can whittle that back. And so having an additional ben, uh, tool like this, an additional uh, customization like this is, I think is always going to be um, uh, a, a consumer benefit. You know, it's a consumer kindness because again, we've got a lot that we need to figure out from the infrastructure side. The services are the, the companies that are going to have to start giving us better control over this kind of stuff. <laughs> Kyoto Asante, but the people want data caps, said Cox, said no one else. Um, uh, from Nick Feld, does anyone else wish that websites just worked as websites on mobile? YouTube and Reddit are the biggest offenders. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I still I still keep all my logins for my YouTube account saved on Firefox for the rare time. You know, like I've got the YouTube Studio app. That doesn't always fix what I need to fix. So sometimes I've just got to go in through a browser and then I hit the desktop mode and then I can get in and, and finish up the stuff that I need to finish up. For Reddit, I've given up. <clears throat> I use Reddit is fun on Android and it's fine. I mean, it's, it's kind of an ugly, simple app, but it kind of recalls the original days of Reddit in its, its sort of black background simplicity. And that's fine. I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> That's all I really need for for the Reddit experience. But yeah, it would be nice if we remembered that the internet is a series of web pages and a browser can often accomplish most of what we need to do instead of having individual apps for every single service that we might want to do. Oh, and Dave Burns is saying Sync for Reddit is a nice app. I've heard of it, but I haven't given it a try. So uh, um so yes, I we've got one vote for sync. And it's probably real good. All right. Um, j just to wrap up the news block here. Oh, I've got to scroll down because there's a picture of a woman that's scantily clad. So if I show the article right from the banner image. <laughs> oh man, YouTube. <sighs> um, I, I, I was kind of torn on, on talking about this story, but... Uh, I feel like there's there's an educational process happening, um, and and you know I've I've been wrong about different internet trends uh, in the past, and and I feel like instead of just editorializing and saying no, this is dumb, don't do it, I feel like just spreading some kind of conversation and commentary about what's going on is probably more appropriate. Is is probably a more grown up way to approach some of this stuff. So. I really don't get, um, I, I really don't, I understand the philosophy of it, but I don't really understand the operation of NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Um, th there's this notion online that we can create sort of a master record of original content <clears throat> attach it to a blockchain register and then verify the ownership of a, a, a single or a significant piece of internet content. I'm grossly oversimplifying here. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the person to come to for a deep dive on, on the technology behind NFT. But as, as I understand it, and someone please correct me if I'm in the comments, if I'm way off here, but as I understand it, as it's being pitched to consumers, you might want to own the thing, not a copy of the thing, but you might want to own the original. Like say it's it's uh, it's an image of a meme from the, the person who originated it. They can create an NFT that then you would know and it's verified through this this blockchain technology that you you have the thing. Dave Burns is saying, hey, close enough. <laughs> Thanks, David. <clears throat> so um, this brings up numerous issues with the way that we handle things like copyright, with the way that we 
verify work that's being created. Uh, someone might create an NFT of something and not have the rights to distribute that thing through our older traditional models of, of copyright patenting and distribution. And Nick Fell with a highlighted comment, NFTs make no sense to me because it is possible to have a bit perfect copy in the real world that's very rarely possible, um, which is true. Um, but again, we, we also seem to value, <clears throat> excuse me, we seem to value some notion of original authenticity verified the first one. You know what I mean? Like say, say you had a classic car and there was a run of a hundred with these performance options and this interior trim and, and like the car community is going to get super hyper fixated on all of the little details and nuance and how it was maintained and how it was restored. We, this is just something ingrained in us as a species that we desire something. And now the internet is trying to create a framework of the same kind of verification. You can have a copy of it. You can have an amazing copy of it. You can have an absolutely perfect copy of it. It's not the original. And some, some people, that's going to burn them up. <laughs> I am not one of those people. <laughs> but this, this is also an opportunity to talk about how woefully out of date our current structure is for things like copyright and, and protecting intellectual property rights and how technology is radically advancing <clears throat> but our legal system isn't keeping pace. So um, you'll, you'll pardon. Here, let me go into the screen share here. This is coming from the New York Times. And you've got to pardon. Um, that's a, about as high as I can go up right there. This is uh, an image of, I believe, the NFT that uh, Emily, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I've always said Ratajkowski. Um, I don't know if it's Ratajkowski or Ratajkowski. Um She's that really famous uh, model. She's been in a bunch of music videos. She's very attractive. Um, she has recently uh, published uh, an, an, an essay and has been joining a broader conversation about an individual's likeness being used to monetize other uh, content that they weren't originally a part of. And this stuff gets really messy when we talk about intellectual property, when we talk about content and copyright. So what, one of the issues that she takes is she can go and be a model and have her photo taken. And then that photo can be used through the, the company that hired her. Say it's a magazine. So she's in a, in a, on a magazine. And then someone else can kind of alter that and use it for their own financial benefit. And so she's been taking issue with um, th there's there, there's an Instagram painter who is taking some of these famous or iconic images from magazines or just from social media and is creating paintings of them on his Instagram. And then he's selling th the artwork and she's not a part of her likeness being monetized through this individual's painting business. So her NFT is an image of her in front of one of his Instagram posts of a painting of her from a magazine that she was hired to model for. So now she is going to try and monetize an image of her in front of one of his paintings, and he's not going to have any financial attachment to this transaction. And this is the sort of content world that we're living in. It's very difficult to break down a YouTube video and talk about a movie or talk about a video game without stepping on some intellectual property rights. It's just it's not really possible. And that's why we have general rules like commentary and critique, but those are very old fashioned in their application. You can't actually go up and say, I'm commenting on this movie. I'm protected by commentary and critique. I'm, I'm protected by fair use um, language in our legal code. It's not proactive. You, you only use that language when you're in a court of law defending your ability to comment on a piece of media. Now, do you have the money to go before a judge 
and sit in court and fight the lawyers of a massive media conglomerate to defend your ability to, to, to talk about their movie? Would you want to spend your time and money that way? So our, our entire process on this is, is woefully out of date. Um, the way that it functions now and, and, and the sort of uh, sort of the conservative method that, that we employ to kind of verify this stuff is is not up to the task of a situation like this. Emily Ratajkowski can't defend her likeness, which is her brand, which is her product. That's what she sells when as a model. She is hired to uh, to show up, to do her job, to be photographed, and then those photographs have a very limited use and probably a limited shelf life. I, I don't believe there are many modeling contracts that are in perpetuity, so it could be something like a five year up, uh, um, a five year rollover, or maybe even like a two year, depending on her status. She could probably write, you know, hey, every year you've got to come back to me and we're going to renegotiate my usage and my likeness for your product. Um, so to have someone else be able to come in and say, well, I took that photo and it wasn't my intellectual property, but I made a painting of it. And that's transformative enough, even though it's almost identical to the photograph that was captured, uh, that's transformative enough for me to sell that and profit off of it. And our courts are kind of stuck. <laughs> like we, I, I don't believe that legal argument holds water, but again, I am not a lawyer. So now we get into this, this tit for tat, you know, now we've got an NFT and it's, it's a part of the blockchain. It's, it's now locked in. You can't remove it or alter it or, or comment on it further, but she doesn't have the IP rights to the Instagram post of the painting that was created of her likeness. The, the, the numerous threads that weave back and forth on this are fascinating and mind boggling how messy this entire situation has gotten. So um, it's, it, it's a huge legal issue that requires better, or, or I would say more educated legal minds than mine to find something that's fair and find some way that we can actually use our justice system to arrive at justice for content creators and for people that are a part of <clears throat> any interaction which involves intellectual property. And see, and Dave Burns, this is this is also a very fair point. Uh, I find her argument will be used to prevent anyone from ever making anything transformative. And and our legal system is very broadsword. You know, a lot of these conversations require scalpel-like nuance. So we make a law, and that law isn't really buttoned down on the specificity of the type of use and the type of interactions and the type of contracts and the type of negotiations, then it can be wielded in very unfair ways. It's such a huge, huge issue with the way that we create content and the way that we distribute content and the way that platforms are not responsible for the content, but they're kind of responsible for the content. And it's all wrapped up in antiquated legal jargon, which is being almost, which is being used almost like metaphors for the current state. Well, what if this uh, NFT were like a photo of a painting? No, we need to start talking about the things that are really there, not trying to describe them based on other methods of distribution from the past. We need a legal system that will incorporate the language of today in describing what the situation of today is. And, and, and for older lawyers, older judges, I can't even begin. I can't even begin to imagine the huge generational wall that we're going to have to break down to move our legal system into the 20th century, let alone the 21st. So um, I am fascinated by this story. I would highly recommend if, if, if you're a nerd like me and you kind of, you kind of get interested in how all of the pieces of a legal argument um, fit together. One, I would highly recommend watching legal, legal, uh, legal, legal DJ um, on YouTube brilliant commentary and some really funny stuff on what really is against the law. You're saying that I don't really think you know what that means. 
Um, brilliant. And, and again, so much of my commentary on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is is has been inspired by him for me to go up and read up some more on, on what's going on with media distribution. Um, but two, just keep an eye on this case too. A photo of a painting of a photo as an NFT. Someone wants to own that. <laughs> I don't know who that person is, but it's Emily Ratajkowski. She's super popular. Um, she's got an enormous fan base uh, of, of people that would be interested in her work and supporting her financially. And she's making a political statement out of this by taking something that isn't hers, but is her likeness. That's crazy. And I love it. And it's nuts. <laughs> ah. So that's the end of the news block. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is getting a little foggy. You know, I said I didn't know when I was going to hit my wall. I'm still feeling pretty clear. Uh, someone tell me if like I'm getting silly in what I'm trying to say. Um, but yeah, my voice is definitely getting a bit soft. Why don't we knock out the, uh, the subreddit real quick? Uh, cause this was a really strong week for me on reddit.com slash R slash glowing rectangles. I'm loving this community more and more every week. Uh, not just because like when I have a really good week, I'm at the top of my own subreddit, but more this last week was also huge for finding some new content creators that I'd never seen before. Excuse me. I, I can't count on YouTube to help me find new stuff. YouTube is only interested in serving me the stuff what's already popular, and there's a pretty good chance I'm already aware of it. So instead, I created a little community that is being beautifully stocked with content from around the world and from voices that don't always get the same kind of, same kind of focus. We're going to go fast this week because I kind of kicked butt this week. I had a real strong week. So, reddit.com slash r slash going rectangles, number one, the OnePlus 9 camera conclusion. Ba-boom. Number two, is the OnePlus 9 camera crippled because it doesn't have OIS? Gasp. I wonder what the results of this will be. <laughs> Bunch of OnePlus videos. It's kind of funny how there seems to be some interest and a little thirst out there for some camera conversation that isn't just, oh, the iPhone's better. It's worth it for the monies. Uh, this one phone doesn't have OIS, and I don't know what that means. So uh, I, I like to see that, you know, some, some of those conversations make it up there. I, I really want to point out the number three, though. So this is an editorial written up by Omar Zahran. I have mispronounced your name, and I do apologize. Your phone is more powerful than you think. Maybe it's time we start relying on our phones to do more. You know I am all about this message. Omar has written up a phenomenal editorial talking about desktop modes, talking about advanced usage, like uh, not just photography, but advanced photo and video editing, being able to distribute that content. And then just the philosophy of redefining what it means to have a pocket computer, uh, a supercomputer in your pocket. Omar has written an incredible letter here. I, I would hope Obviously, I'm behind that message. I, my phone challenge is all about trying to get people to do more with their phones. This letter is another excellent example of some writing. I would never have found ozoneletter.substack.com on a Google search. Number three. Number three with a bullet on our glowing rectangles. And, and if you're inclined, if you value this kind of commentary, I would radically hope you give this a share somewhere. Share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, find a subreddit where it's appropriate to share this kind of content, give it a share there. This is the kind of commentary you want. If you're into tech and you wanna see other people who care about this stuff, they Omar didn't write this because like, it's got a bunch of Samsung and Apple keywords, so it's going to do really good for SEO. The click-through rate's going to be really great, and the ad revenue is going to climb because it's more of a trending topic. You don't get any benefit for any direct financial benefit for writing an editorial like this. It, you write an editorial like this because you care. 
And if you care about con content from creators who care, you've got to do more than just read or watch. You have to put forth the little bit of effort to give it a nudge, to give it a share, to get it out there. It's got two hearts <laughs> on the actual article. I don't, I think I need to subscribe. I gave it a third heart. There you go. Uh, you know, uh, later on today, I'm going to give it a, a retweet. But that was a brilliantly written editorial. And again, I would not have found it were it not for someone sharing it on glowing rectangles. Uh, just kind of rounding out a few of the other top stories, my phone challenge, which is very much in keeping with Omar's editorial there, is in the number four spot. Uh, number five, from pa Painfully Honest Tech, the iPad Pro 2021 is still not a computer replacement. Some folks looking at the Galaxy A82. Um, we've got Tech Alter on the Friday checkout talking about the M1 series and making a joke about Siri and what's a computer. Uh, we've got... <clears throat> Christopher Westerholm with 1.2 thousand subscribers looking at LG G4 cinematic style video in 4K. I mean, that's just kind of cool. Taking an older phone that we wouldn't think would be that competitive, but still shot great 4K video and looking at how to turn it into more of a cinematic look. That's rad. Get more use out of your gadgets. And maybe your older gadgets are performing better and more competitively than you think they are. Um, we've got Alt Dad Tech. Uh, well, congratulations to Alt Dad Tech because I believe he just broke a thousand subscribers. But he had uh, this is from Jay Williams. Um, Jay Williams had Alt Dad Tech on just for a stream and a conversation. We've got a parody from Sam Time about the Apple announcement. We've got Poetic Wiz with 132 subscribers talking about the iPad Pro 2021. And we've got Mark's Tech uh, looking back at the OnePlus 9 Pro update after the most recent, uh, after the OnePlus 9 Pro camera, after the most recent update. We've got a wonderful lineup. Uh, YMAX it, Realme 8, uh, lots of OnePlus, lots of iPad Pro commentary. Um, Josh Vergara with AirPop Active Plus Halo Smart Mask, <laughs> making safe smarter. Um, it's really, really cool stuff. I mean, again, this this was a crazy, great, broad, fun uh, week on the subreddit. So reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Um, I, I, again, I, I really hope that, excuse me, y'all go check it out. Share some upvotes, but then also if, if you find a content creator that you're digging, you like their work, get out there and support them. Find any opportunity to, to, to help them out. And that's what it's going to take to get the content that you want to see. You want to see more content from them? Just kind of passively watching once and going, oh, that was neat. Uh, it doesn't mean you're going to get to see anything from them again. And of course, uh, you know, when I have a strong week, it's always very gratifying to see myself at the top of my own subreddit. <laughs> <laughs> from swolo like solo i'm totally watching that g4 video that's my favorite phone of all time i took the g4 cameras out a couple months back a g4 camera out a couple months back that camera is still phenomenal it is such a great shooting experience you know it's a little tweaky compared to the auto hdr that we have today but um the 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 HDR it created, if you can hold still, was really solid, uh, considering. I, I, I don't always love that kind of multi-exposure, super bright mode. But then the RAW files were sick. And so if you want that really great, bright, crushed, dynamic range look from HDR, like the RAW file on a G4 is just as competitive today as it is against the RAW files from numerous cameras. Um, outside of the ultra super premium tier of phones. I mean, it's just a wonderful, wonderful accomplishment from LG. I mean, it's just a shame that the G4 is always going to be linked with boot loops when there are so many examples. Like I've got two G4s and a, and a V10 that are still going strong today. I can't say the same of any of my Samsungs from that era. Um, 
And Matt Tyler, let's take a second, guys. Alt Dad Tech had 230, 31 subs when he first popped on the Reddit. Huge congrats for hitting 1,000. He just recently did a stream. I kind of poked into the comments of that stream for a bit. Um, who did he have on? He had Jay Williams and, oh, uh, Trent, uh, Mr. Tech Rant. Um, a great stream. Seriously, seriously good stream. Um, I, you know, I, my ears were kind of burning, I guess, when I tuned in. And I tuned in just as he was referencing me making fun of other reviewers by using wacky voices. So it was definitely like my bat signal. Like, oh, hey, someone's talking about how reviewers are wrong on the internet. You know, I better suit up. <laughs> I'm that guy. <laughs> Um, from Arthur Lee 525, random question, what's the reason to why it's called glowing rectangles? Because all of our life is now dominated by... It's always it's just been the generic term that I've used to uh, d describe the future that we currently live in. And, uh, you know, for Reddit, I just wanted something that was unique. Like, you kind of have to know what it is, and you kind of have to know what you're in for to want to participate on glowing rectangles. And so if it were just promote your YouTube, that would be awful. You would not want to engage on that subreddit. <laughs> so instead, um, I named it something a little bit more esoteric, but hopefully that contributes to a broader conversation and not just hype self-promotion. We'll see. Again, we're, what, we climbed up again. We're at 1734, 1,734 members. So that's kind of the gig. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, if it continues to grow like that, because it's been organic and I'd prefer that over just hype, I guess. Anyway. <laughs> All right, let's um, let's get through the gadget block because then I, I want to save the, the wrap up here. Uh, OnePlus 9 Pro versus Galaxy S21. Who's excited? I, be, be, while I'm getting into the news stories here for the gadget block, in the comments, who voted on my OnePlus 9 video? And just leave a, a, like a, I did, or I voted, or a thumbs up, or something like that. Because, like I said, I had lots of yapping. There were so many threads of comments and conversations on that video, and not nearly as many people actually voted. So especially for the core group of folks that I have here, I'd imagine that representation was a bit better. You were actually out there participating and not just flapping your gums about what someone else said about the camera. You actually tried to play the game. So, um... <clears throat> oh, Matt Tyler. Oh, you, you scamp, you. So, um... Who wants to watch a TV show about Samsung cameras? I'm not sure that this is for me, but one of the things that I'm kind of happy to see is anyone taking content creation from mobile more seriously and not just assuming that that, can't, that conversation can only happen through iPhones. You know, uh, there, there's a sort of general pop populace idea that like shot on an iPhone is something worthy of a billboard that somehow the iPhone is doing something that makes it worthy of taking the images from the iPhone and using them in more professional endeavors. I, I would say again, since like the G4 era, the V10 era, that era of smartphones, I feel like that's been demonstrably not true that Apple is somehow magic in this regard. And especially if you're looking for pro use, so many phones have interesting things to offer and can fit very specific kinds of workflow depending on what you need to accomplish. It's not just one platform is, is an objective superior to another. Everything has, has a different blend of pros and cons. So I'm, I'm not particularly interested in watching the show that they're putting together because it's basically just going to be a running series of commercials for the Galaxy S21. But if you catch this on Hulu, Samsung is actually making something to promote the professional use of their products. 
So uh, this was written up by CNN Business by Claire Duffy. Um, Samsung is taking promotion to a new level by co-creating a six-part series for Hulu in which eight photographers use its new Galaxy S21 Ultra 5G phone to take photos and compete for a prize worth $250,000. They go on to talk about this is like a $1,200 phone. It's a highly competitive market against an $1,100 iPhone. As internet users grow savvier about muting, blocking, or skipping advertisements, Samsung hopes its new show will be a more appealing way to get the device in front of consumers. The series called Exposure follows the format of other popular reality competition shows like Project One Runway or The Great British Baking Show, only this time it was created to showcase a specific project, not just competitors' talents. Um, so uh, this series is set to air on Hulu starting, I believe, starting today, uh, starting Monday. So it's all about the S21 Ultra, and you'll see, like, especially in what I'm sharing here, the, the setup, the set looks exactly like every other reality show. Like three judges are looking at your work and then judging your work based on on what you're you're trying to accomplish. Now, the thing is, on the one hand, that's why I'm excited. I want to see these kinds of conversations grow. I feel there's so much more you could be getting out of your phone. And you could also be learning more about crafting your own style of composition, capturing your family memories, improving the content that you produce. I mean, we use these big phrases and these big terms like that. I wrote a whole book about using your smartphone to do more photography and more video stuff. But consumers are, are sort of reluctant to do that. Their own behavior suggests that they care. You know, sharing on social media, editing videos for TikTok, you know, slapping filters on photos before they post to Instagram. Consumers are doing a high level of content creation from their phones. It's just when we use the terminology of content creators, when we use the terminology of photographers, oh, I don't want any part of that. Oh, the shutter speeds and the ISOs and the megapixels, mm, that's not for me. But then they go and take like 12 photos of their lunch and then spend a minute on the filter that they're going to use before they actually eat their lunch, you know? <laughs> so they do care. I want more people to care. What I'm not interested in, in, in is watching a six-part advertisement for the Galaxy S21 Ultra. Like, again, it's, it's going to come down to a lot of, like, Samsung terminology, Samsung this. Oh, and when we use the steady, the super steady shot feature of the Samsung Galaxy S21 Ultra 5G, you know, like that kind of stuff, especially in the context of reality show production, I am not about. It's just going to be exhausting. But hopefully this improves some kind of mind share for improving the content that you get out of your phones. The only thing that's a bummer is if it's only linked with Samsung, then it makes my job way harder. Like, oh, has anyone done a show about the OnePlus 9 Pro? Is anyone doing shows about Xperia's? Well, no, because... Samsung has $10 billion a year that they throw at their marketing. So when you go and you look at all the things that were cut out of the Galaxy S21 and how prices didn't really get that much better for the things that they removed generation over generation, one of the reasons why is because they spend so much on marketing. So you got to make up that money somewhere. And those costs filter down to consumers. So in this show, it's a six-episode series with reality show TV production, and that ain't cheap, distribution on Hulu, and the grand prize is $250,000. How many Galaxy S21 Ultras do you need to sell to make up the production costs of this show and a $250,000 grand prize for one of the contestants on the show? At some point, the accounting has to meet up. <laughs> at some point um you know you you do have to pay for that so i, I don't know some, someone watch it for me you know what i would love to do is, is like have someone do like a like a book report my experience is watching exposure galaxy cameras are great <laughs> dave burns i bet it's more than 12 <laughs> You have to sell more than 12 Galaxy S21 Ultra 5Gs um, to make up the production costs and the $250,000 grand prize. <laughs> From Paul Purry. Well, if LG had done a TV show, maybe people would have purchased their devices too soon. 
<laughs> oh my heart. And again, if, if you were doing any show on using a smartphone for content creation, I, I think y'all know how I would have felt about LG's. You know, again, I, I'm looking at this and thinking, you know, if I really wanted to make something with the phone, I wonder what Sony's talking about right now. Cause I feel like, I feel like Xperia might be the right answer to a lot of those questions. Uh, moving right along. I want to spend just a little time here. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, I feel like <laughs> Raymond, it's never too soon. Um, uh, Apple announced a bunch of new products. It sort of sucks all the air out of the room for sort of a cycle of tech commentary. So every video that went out that week kind of had to tacitly acknowledge that Apple did something. Um, my, my feelings on this are a little bit easier to sum up. Uh, the, the main crux of this commentary, if you want the deeper dive on this, go check out Best of Our Week, um, last Thursday's episode with me and TK. Uh, like we went through the Apple website and, and, and dug through the new iMac, the new iPad, talked about AirTags. We shared a lot of thoughts. Um, I, I'm going to keep my thoughts here a little bit simpler because I, I feel I'm, I'm already talked out. <laughs> about Apple. And that's not really, you know, one of the major topics um, for this podcast. So going to the Apple website, um, new iMac. I am really not feeling the new iMac. I feel there are so many design decisions here that don't make a lot of sense to me. And this is another situation where I feel Apple's waning interest in desktops is exacerbated by their focus on mobile. When they make the most money on iPhone and iPad, they're making their laptops more like their tablets, and now they're making their desktops more like their, their tablets too. And some of these designs just, they don't really make a ton of sense to me. So yes, we've got all these vibrant colors. They're really pretty. And actually, like I don't mind the chin. I don't love the white bezel, but it, it makes sense to me from sort of like the, the candy colored iMac, or the, you know, the original days of the iMac. What I don't completely get are things like we've made it so thin, it's probably going to be impossible to maintenance. And why are we incorporating a magnetic charger on the back of an iMac? I feel like there's an immediate reaction to well, let's say you've got your desk set up and your kids are running around and if they trip on the cable for the iMac, it's gonna yank the cable out. I kind of get that, but the way that it feeds through this base, through this stand, I kind of feel like MagSafe is only gonna protect you so far and then everything else you need to do on this computer is gonna involve additional cables anyway. So it's still gonna yank the iMac off the table if you've got it so precariously set up that kids or pets can run by and, and knock things off of your desk. So I don't, I don't understand why MagSafe became the thing to have for a desktop. It's kind of cool, but I don't, I don't get why or how or what this solves or what. So again, it leaves me just sort of perplexed. It leaves the, common, the commentary around the iMac a bit incomplete. And for all of these other ports, like these USB-C and Thunderbolt ports, we've got additional mess for like having an ethernet jack. You know, this is not a laptop. This is not a mobile product. You set it up on your desk and you use this in your compute environment. And in situations like that, it's still, it's still better. It's still preferable to have an ethernet connection, but that's now being moved to the power brick. And you're like, so, You've made this a little bit cleaner in terms of design just sitting right in front of me. You've made the cable management and the support for this product so much more difficult in routing everything around on my desk. You can't upgrade it. Everything's kind of soldered in and fused into the SOC. Uh, you're going to have to have, if you want to have some kind of local backup, it's got to be through other external drives. And, and I, I just it's another step in a direction where Apple has this huge reputation for, for content creators, but their pro products to a large degree don't really fulfill that kind of use. Like you've got to jump through Apple's hoops and only use Apple products in the way that Apple wants you to use them. And then you can achieve some good work. 
but pros want to work the way they want to work. So some of them have been trained by Apple, it's gonna be fine. Others are gonna look at this and go like, how, why, what, what's going on? And especially for how well thought out and how well designed the last Mac Pro was built around Intel processors, I'm curious, can you achieve something like that with M1 or with Apple Silicon? Um, I, I, I'm not sure where, where we're at here. And, and my ability to recommend products to my family and friends is difficult with a product like the iMac. Because again, I've got a, a number of, you know, like my, my cousins who absolutely need to have iPhone Pros because they're the best, but they barely use their phones for the lowest level of communication um, are probably in line already for these new iMac. <laughs> you know $1,300 oh but it comes in orange I need it um cool that's fine um but again as we make this transition into Apple custom SOCs and Apple Silicon um the iMac I don't know I don't think the iMac makes as strong an argument for its existence as the Mac mini or the MacBook again uh, you know I, I feel like it's a more complete product so th this this one is is troubling me um yeah, we'll, 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 we'll have to, it's going to sell great again. I mean, it's Apple and they'll make a bunch of really fun commercials with candy colors and, and that's fine. Um, I, I'm at a loss as to how to recommend when people ask me about these kinds of things, like what are you doing on your computer? And is your old computer really outclassed? But it's in orange. Okay, <laughs> I guess go get one. Uh, so, um, the flip side of this, where I feel Apple is actually doing something kind of interesting and where I feel th this is stronger. Uh, let me, let me get back to the Apple website here. Sorry. iPad pro. So all my complaints about the iMac, how it's built, what it's designed for, how you're supposed to use it. It's the main computer. Oops, sorry, I'm bumping my mic. It's the main computer. It's not a companion product. I have some issues where, where, we're, where we're at with Apple and desktops. I'm actually the flip side on Apple and tablets. So the iPad Pro has been announced and it's supercharged by the Apple M1 chip. And what's hilarious is the, the base model iPad Pro is actually going to get a better variant of the M1 than what's in the base model iMac. There's a seven core GPU in the base model iMac, and there's an eight core GPU in the iPad Pro. But this, this is kind of the opposite. If we look at what a tablet is for, we look at how a tablet can be a primary computing platform, but is often a complement to your workflow. It's, it's often a companion device. I am a lot more positive on an iPad Pro using this new M1, as we know that Apple is trying to make their Macs more like the iPads and, and the iPhones. So a lot of the development, a lot of the software, a lot of the support Apple is trying to drag Mac OS users more into iPad style environments, more into app environments than the other way around. We're not trying to turn iPhones and iPads more into Mac OS. So I know I've seen those, those editorials like, oh, well, you should just put Mac OS on the iPad. And I say, no, 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 no. We should demand that Apple desktops should be capable of more. But what I wanna see is an iPad mobility focused operating system environment that can make better use of the screen real estate that can that can make better use of accessories that can that can multitask better but still operates within the 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 UI and the metaphor of a tablet 
you know, it's kind of the rough spot, you know, like I love what a Microsoft Surface is, but I totally understand why there are some disconnects between a more touchscreen fluid tablet style interface and a more traditional desktop x86 legacy software kind of interface. They don't, they don't gel. And so it would be kind of cool if the iMac had a touchscreen and you could use it more like an iPad because it's already becoming a big iPad. But I want that that streamlined focus with the 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 higher tier of hardware and power so that app developers really start taking mobile more seriously. You know, Apple making this move means the the development and the code that's already applied. You know, there's a version of DaVinci Resolve that's built for M1 Mac OS. Well, something would tell me that you've done most of the heavy lifting now. Resolve can now take a look at this iPad Pro and go, hey, there are a few things that we need to tweak, but now we can get Resolve running on an iPad. That code base, the support, you should be able to kind of move these things around a bit more easily. And so then you get amazing video editing software, uh, desktop grade photo editing software, but it's still on a more streamlined UI. It's on a more focused interface. And that to me is is a net positive. That, that to me is a perk of what we might be able to do with this type of hardware. You'd still probably, if you're a creative professional, you'd still probably want a home computer, but you might not need one. You know, like the, an iPad is probably powerful enough to get a huge amount of work done, especially graphic design. You get a pencil and you go to town. So I, I'm, I'm a lot more positive on this um, M1 iPad than I think people would have thought. <laughs> you know, like everyone was ready for me to be the crank. I forget where I was. I think it was a Twitter space. And, and you know, like I was popping in just to say like, hey, you know, actually, I, I think this is kind of a good idea. And, and the criticisms are fair. There's, there's not a lot of software that's, that's going to be ready to go, but that sort of happened with the first iPad Pro. You know, the first iPad Pro came out and there wasn't a ton you could do on it that was any different than a regular iPad, but it was more powerful. So developers kind of tapped into that and they were encouraged to develop for it. And I feel like this is a chicken or the egg. Sometimes we really want the software to be there first, but other times we kind of need the hardware to just be there even if it's not fully utilized in the week that you get it so that developers know this is a platform worth developing for. And now I'm just desperate for the trickle down. You know, if, if Resolve can function this well on an Apple M1, will we eventually get a chipset for Android or for Windows on ARM that it makes sense for Resolve to, to, to move and migrate that to a mobile focused product in Android land or in Windows land. You know, if, if it doesn't happen somewhere first, then we never get it. And, and what we talked about last week, you know, there, there was a recent change to Vulkan, um, the, the Vulkan uh, chipset drivers, graphics drivers to better support video in Vulkan. Well, that means we would have GPU compute capabilities on Android devices for video editing software. That could be huge. And if we start taking that more seriously, Resolve can get in and say, hey, if we can do GPU rendering on an Android tablet, maybe now's the right time for us to bring some of this work over to Android, and then you can also edit there too. So, so that's my hope. It's a lot to put on the iPad Pro, and it probably won't be fulfilled, <laughs> right? First generation of an iPad with an M1 might be one of those evolutionary missing links. You know, it might never fully live up to its potential, but from the outside looking in, I've been way more interested in seeing what an iPad might be able to do than I have in a long time. And, and this move to me is the right move if Apple is eventually gonna blur the lines between iPad OS and Mac OS. I'm not really invested in Mac OS. The only product line that I think Apple is really nailing right now is iPad OS. Proper multitasking, good USB accessory support on USB-C connectors. I'm, I'm mad about the, the, the iPads make me mad that iPhones aren't as capable. 
because they absolutely should be. If I could get iPad OS on a phone, that would I would probably have jumped ship to Apple by now. But they won't give it to me because Apple. <laughs> ah. All right. I missed a bunch of comments in here. <laughs> Remember, Juan, it just works. <laughs> uh. Oh, from Alice Bockley. Uh, have you been to the R iPhone 12 subreddit lately? Just works equals just as many complaints as with any other device. I, you know what, what's been frustrating is like, uh, and I've been trying to participate on a, a variety of other subreddits. Like you've seen me comment a lot on like the LG subreddits. And uh, you know, a lot of those subreddits are just becoming like eulogy sites and fire sale sites. Um, but like, if you go to a OnePlus Reddit, that's not where you go to talk about how much you like OnePlus phones. That's where you go to talk about how much you hate what OnePlus has become and how they're a failure and how no one likes them. And it's this insane echo chamber um, confirmation bias platform now. The, the individual subreddits, and I would have to imagine that an R iPhone 12 um, is probably the same. You know, if you made a subreddit focused specifically on a phone, that's where everyone goes to complain when something doesn't work the way they think it should. And it's really sad. You know, again, I, I've been having conversations with a couple of smaller phone manufacturers behind the scenes and just saying, like, if you're not out there guiding the conversation on your products, then the Internet echo chamber is going to fill that void and it's all going to be negative and it's all going to suck. And that's what people are going to find when they search for specific conversations about your gear. JJ talking about Linux, uh, especially if we're talking about right to repair. Linux is definitely not um, Linux is definitely not something to sleep on. <laughs> From Gormlord, I hope they bring back the Jeff Goldblum ads. That would be epic. That would be really cool. I'd be all about that. Um, Aditya Juan is hyped for Air Tags. I'm not even bringing up Air Tags in this. Uh, we, we've we've talked about Apple enough. From Tech Love and Mama, I love purple, but I would not spend so much just for the color I want. I'll paint my current PC before ever considering to buy a computer just because of the color. You know, I feel that's fair. Um, and especially, you know, I, I kind of like, you know, my desktop with RGB, you know? Uh, it's, it's a blackout build, but then I can flick on all of the rainbow unicorn puke colors if, if I want color. Um, I don't really mess with the RGBs. It's either blue or green. I'm so simple. <laughs> it's, it's not fancy. Um, uh, from Casio third, if the iPad OS wasn't so limited, I think the iPad pro would kill the MacBook air and the MacBook pro 13. And, and this is where I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I agree. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm not picking on your comment because I disagree. I agree, but, um, Apple is so conservative about any tweak or any change. And you're like, they've had the capabilities to, to support touchscreens on Macs for a while. Them actually implementing that into software and hardware is, is a bridge too far. They're not going to disrupt individual product lines. As far as Apple's concerned, you should want an iMac and a MacBook and an iPad and an iPhone and, and your whole family should be kitted out with multiple iterations of product to fulfill very specific use case scenarios. I really can't get my work done on an iPhone. It's too restrictive. I probably could on an iPad, but I want to work from a phone. You know, it's, it's that kind of mentality where if you gave me just a little bit more on an iPhone, I wouldn't need to buy an iPad. Well, this, now that I've said that out loud, that's exactly what they're not going to do. As soon as they know I can achieve more from one of their products and I don't need to own two of their products, they're going to restrict the divisions between those devices. And that's what's, that's what's frustrating. But that's also why if I'm interested in anything, I feel like the iPad Pro fulfills the... the the, it does a better job of fulfilling the Apple marketing claims. I don't believe any iPhone is revolutionary or magic or pro or great for content creators in any way that another phone can't compete. It's not magic. Most phones can do what an iPhone can do. It's, this, is, this is silly. 
there is no tablet like an iPad that really does live up to that kind of claim from the manufacturer. And now we've got one with way more horsepower than you can really use at present. So if there's any growth opportunity for the iPad, it's with this iPad Pro. So we'll see. Ah, <sighs> from Doomer, anything related to tech and Reddit is basically full of negative stuff and complaints, but comments on GSM Arena are way worse. Actually, a lot of the individual websites can get pretty toxic. Uh, but you know what? There are some good subreddits out there. It's just harder to hunt for them. Like I really got to throw like the LG V60 community has been amazing for supporting users on V60s where different regions, um, as they've been getting their Android 11 updates, have been finding different bugs that um, need to be addressed. And so as folks have been trying to troubleshoot and trying to figure out what's going on, um, that community has been amazing. Uh, it really has been. It, it, obviously, they're complaining about something negative. There's a bug in the software on this phone. Um, but it's not just, oh, LG sucks, and they don't have enough worth it for the monies. So you should, like, if you own one, you should, like, kill yourself. You know, it, it, it's not that. It's like, hey, let's figure this out together because we love these phones and we're not getting any more of them. So it, it, it really is, like, subreddit by subreddit. Um, just one other little bit on Apple. Uh, apparently, when you get uh, a, a new Mac, a, a new iPad Pro, you're going to need a new Magic Keyboard. So the, the old Magic Keyboard will not work on the new Mac Pro. And it's Apple. Again, instead of having sort of universal accessories at work, they don't just work. Oh, we're updating the iPad Pro. You need a new Apple Pencil. Why? Because that's how we make more money. You want us to do well, right? We're Apple. So um, I feel yeah, we're at 10.30. Mm, I'm right on schedule. It's so rare that I'm, I'm actually on point here. So, um, let me get this out of the way here. Oh, and Paco soon is telling me I need to check my posture as I bump the mic. Uh, ooh, I got a good shoulder pop there. Who wants to talk about the crippled camera on the OnePlus 9? All right, I saw those, those of you, like I thought, anyone who was really down to like drop a comment on this chat, most likely was already participating and uh, hooked up a vote on the uh, OnePlus 9 uh, camera uh, comparison that I, that I put up. So uh, actually, you know what? Let me, uh, let me pull this up here. Um, wh uh, actually, what I should say first, do I have it in my studio app? I don't. So I was going through each of the comments for people that actually put in votes. Oh, first off, though, uh, those of you listening to the audio version of the podcast, there's going to be a bit of a cut here because what we're going to be doing is looking at the photo and video comparisons. So you're going to hear a lot of this is phone A and this is phone B. And that makes for terrible audio podcasting. So unfortunately, from about here, we're going to split and then go to the end of the podcast. Uh, if you want to check this out, please uh, check out you know the video. Uh, there's the Twitch re replay. There's going to be a YouTube replay. And I'll probably do a cut of this just as its own standalone video. Um, <laughs> from F. Mooney, watching Juan explain to people how to answer the question was quite amusing. So... Um, <laughs> Oh, Paul Purry, that's dirty. I can't even repeat that. So uh, I put up this video. This is the OnePlus 9. Is it a crippled camera? And uh, I, I went through and showcased the differences uh, between these two. I, I'm just doing kind of a video stream right now. And they aren't the same. So it's five setups, manual mode, a walking nighttime video, uh, a, a night mode in really low light, an auto HDR, but this isn't a night mode photo. This is just auto HDR. And then wrapping it up with another ultra low light night mode shot. And so there's phone A and phone B in each one of these setups. They are not the same. 
So once you think you know, oh, well, this is phone B, then phone B is the OnePlus, and it was the OnePlus for every single setup. That's not how I do this. Again, this the, the, the claims being made aren't, you know, the OnePlus 9 camera is pretty close to a Galaxy S21, but there are some pros and cons and maybe something that you need to be concerned about if you really care about optical image stabilization. That's not the claim being made. The claim being made is that the OnePlus 9 doesn't have OIS, so it's crippled. And there was just like another, like there was a, an Indian reviewer who recently just put out another, like why I'm not buying anything in, from OnePlus in 2021. And again, it's the same kind of smirking truism. <laughs> I mean, who could even sell a premium phone without OIS in 2021? There's even OIS on a Nord. Okay. But did we see photo samples between a OnePlus 9 and a Nord? Because something tells me if you really did any of the work that the OnePlus 9 cameras could pretty easily, pretty handily smack down the Nord. And do you know how I know that? Is because I've really shot on both phones. <laughs> I actually did some of the work, right? Oh, see, see, it's different when you really use the product instead of just smirking into your really fancy mirrorless camera and, and then fill in a bunch of B-roll and then spit out your hot take based on some spec sheet. So we're going to go through. I've got the photos kind of queued up here. Um <laughs> <laughs> from Fat Produce. Just put your phone in, in a shredder. It couldn't possibly be worth it. And if you own that phone, then you should feel bad. Basically unusable. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna break these down setup by setup. And and again, we're gonna do the same thing. I wanna see in 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 the comments. I wanna see these votes. All right, so OBS was being a little weird, so I had to kind of crop to 16 by 9. In the video, it's the full a full four by three, and then I did a crop in just to kind of match. So what we're gonna start with is one of the hardest parts of this test. What is the claim? Optical image stabilization should be mandatory on this phone. It's the only way to have a good camera. What is optical image stabilization? OIS is a way for you to smooth out the little movements and shake and judder from you holding the device. That's it. It's not the technology that helps you freeze movement from your subject. It's the technology that smooths out your movements. Most of what people think is OIS today is really accomplished through software. Most of the uh, image stacking, most of the video stabilization, most of it is not the little lens that wiggles inside the camera assembly. So one of the ways to demonstrate that, we're going to start with a manual self-portrait. This was shot in the manual mode, has the least amount of computational uh, processing applied. So when you are shooting an auto HDR, it does that burst. It takes a number of photos, stacks them all together, and then it creates an HDR image based on that. It's a way to improve light and clarity, but we're not doing that. Our first setup is manual. Now, why? Because if we were ever to see a clear difference between image stabilization and how it helps you capture a longer, uh, a longer exposure, we would want the setup on each phone that does the least amount of processing. So I've got this set up here. Oh, whoops. I've got this set up here. Whoops. <laughs> I got to go to the right photo. Okay. So this is phone A. Everyone got a good look at this? You can kind of see. This is a, a, a near blackout night shot where I'm standing on a, an empty stretch of road um, off a hiking trail, and there's only one street lamp, which is almost a half a block away. That's the only light that's hitting my face. So this is phone A, and this is phone B. 
Now, obviously these were shot on different nights, but again, I feel like I got the composition and me centered in the frame decently enough. All right, I wanted to see in the comments, phone A, phone B. Which phone took which image? And then if you want, we can do them side by side. So here's phone A on the left, phone B on the right. Uh, Aditi Anil saying phone A is the OnePlus. Uh, My Tech is saying phone A, OnePlus. Uh, Squishy Man 2007 is saying phone B, OnePlus. Fat Produce is saying phone B, OnePlus. Um, well, I hate to break it to, to Samsung folks, but if you don't use a ton of post-processing and image stacking and HDR tricks, then phone A is the Galaxy S21. Uh, phone A is the phone with the Amazeballs optical image stabilization, which helps so much in low light photos. What are we doing, folks? I mean, that's ridiculous. I'm shooting this off of the rear cameras. I'm shooting this blind. There's the twitch as I hit the volume rocker. <laughs> There's a click as I hit the volume rocker to take the photo as the phone is backwards to me. I am not able to compose for this except for kind of lining up where I think I'm reflecting properly in the camera modules on, on the back of this phone. There, is so, there are so many opportunities to shake, to wiggle, to judder the image, and this is the final output. I cannot more clearly demonstrate how different sensor technologies can not only make up the difference of having optical image stabilization, but can improve <laughs> upon OIS. Now, how, is, how does this happen? How is this achieved? If you go into the metadata, um, Samsung is using a ridiculously low ISO. Uh, OnePlus is using a ridiculously high ISO. So in, in a setup like this, if you were to pixel peep to 700% of just my eyeball, the image from the OnePlus is gonna be a little bit grainier. But it's not gonna be a lot of bit grainier. It's gonna be a little bit grainier. So you tell me in, 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 in this live chat, in this live stream, if you absolutely needed to depend on one of these cameras in really low light conditions, which technology is gonna better serve you? A smaller sensor with optical image stabilization or a larger sensor that can operate at a higher ISO? I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. This is just silly at this point if we're really complaining about these types of, of photo comparisons. Oh, I took a photo with the OnePlus 9 in mixed lighting of a moving subject and it was a little bit blurry. Yeah, and it would have been on a Galaxy. But you're not showing me two photos taken at the same time under the same conditions from comparably priced smartphones. These are both phones sub $800. This is an even comparison. Well, I, but I can get a really good deal on a, an S21 Ultra. Cool. You can also get, you know, BOGOs, two for ones and, and free on contract sales for a OnePlus 9. So again, you might save a couple hundred bucks on an S21 Ultra. I, I can get two OnePlus 9s for the same price as one. So at $300, are you telling me that the OnePlus 9 is not competitive? Because that's, that's ridiculous. I need techies to be better at this stuff because right now they suck. I also want to point this out here too, real quick. You see where the wall behind me is? One of the things that I goofed on this setup, the wall is much lower on the Galaxy S21 shot, and the wall is higher on the OnePlus 9 shot. I, <laughs> I hate to break it to Galaxy folks, but I was 10 feet closer to the lamp on the Galaxy S21. So let's, let's look at this one more time. With, uh, with optical image stabilization and closer to the light source versus no optical image stabilization and farther away from the light source.
Come on. <laughs> and, and also, I mean, again, everyone's like, oh, but the white balance. Yeah, it's an ugly yellow lamp. You know, again, if, if, if you're going to debate the merits, you've got to compare white balance on a number of metrics. Do you care more about the quality of the light or do you care more about the true scientific white? And there is no correct answer. There isn't. You know, the one plus nine shows me leaning into the quality of the light. So if it's ugly lighting, yeah, I'm going to look really urine yellow. But if I were at a concert, and I were trying to capture photos of a cool band or stage act under purple and red and blue lighting, I would want that over the true scientific white of trying to make sure the band members are properly exposed. So it's not a right answer. There's no one winner. It's only a conversation over application and what you hope to accomplish. So either are correct. It's just I would want one more in one situation. And honestly, if my differences are this stark, I'll take the warmer white balance and edit. <laughs> I cannot recover as much information on the Galaxy S21 shot. I cannot fix that as well. So who wants to see some video? All right, moving on to setup number two. This is a low light walking video in UHD at 60 frames per second. <laughs> Braden, Samsung, your skin doesn't have texture. Now, to be fair, there are a few situations where OnePlus does the same thing. <laughs> I don't feel like there's a winner there either. <laughs> We're talking auto modes and portraits. Like, I don't know. You're going to win a lot of people over by making them look good. And skin smoothing is one of those things. So, unfortunately, uh, I, I don't feel like Samsung. No, I, I, I should say. Samsung doesn't deserve as much ire there when lots of other folks or lots of other manufacturers are doing the same thing. All right, so um, next up. So, okay, so uh, setup number one, B, the better looking photo, one plus nine. Now, so I'm walking video in really low light at 60 frames per second. So at 60 frames per second, that means our frame rate and our shutter speed are cut in half over the amount of light that we can get at 30 frames per second. So this is, this is immediately going to be one stop less light from each, uh, from each sensor. Now remember, OIS is about smoothing out your hand movements, but is OIS really the driving factor in, in, in video stabilization? So let's take a look. This is phone A. Oh, I gotta make sure, uh, just real quick, uh, watch your speakers and audio. I'm pretty sure I muted all of this stuff, but um, there's some traffic noise that might get loud. Haha, -ha, I muted it. Here's phone A. I'm just gonna let this play for a bit. Do, 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 do. I'm walking down the street. La, 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 la. All right, actually, if you've been following my camera reviews, you should have a pretty good idea what phone that was because there is a certain type of optical defect in the lens that you can see on one manufacturer that should be very clear. Not the digital judder effect, but the optical effect. And now here's phone B. All right, we got a pretty good look at that. Let, let's, let's do this just one more time. Phone A. And now phone B. Fat Produce is saying B is the one plus. Simon says Hypno is saying B is the one plus. Casio third, B is the one plus. Loki Ted, B is the one plus. A lot of folks are now, are now rooting for one plus. But wait a minute. Phone B's video is markedly smoother. But we can't have markedly smoother video on a phone without OIS, right? Now, obviously, again, if you're, if you're following my commentary, phone B is the OnePlus. This is what a Galaxy S21 puts out because it uses a smaller sensor at 60 frames per second, it's gonna struggle to pick up light. And then when you're really maxing out the, the shutter, each individual frame is gonna get a little bit blurrier. It also can't jack the ISO as high as the OnePlus can. 
So that individual frame is gonna be softer, then you're gonna kind of try and crop it and you're gonna try and move your frame in. The, the software is going to do its best to move around the frame to try and keep it smooth. But some of those frames are gonna be really blurry and juddery, so you end up with this mess. Now, if you were really paying attention to my camera commentary, what you'll also see is look at how the street lamps wiggle in the reflections internally. The Samsung lens is really bad about internal reflections bouncing around inside your shot. So I gotta say, I mean, like the Galaxy S21 is really doing a pretty good job of smoothing out my footfalls. Night video like that is very difficult. And you can see as the street lamps and the, the headlights in the cars are reflecting around in the frame, how much they're wiggling around. I'm giving people seizures by doing this with my hands right now. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. You can see how much smoother the frame is compared to the wiggles of the street lamps. OnePlus's lens is better. The OnePlus 9 uses a better lens. As I'm walking through, where, where are the street lamp reflections? They, they aren't there. You cannot see the internal reflection of the street lamp bouncing around inside the frame. It just doesn't exist. The video is brighter, is more detailed, is smoother, and that's all because of the advantages of using a larger sensor over a smaller sensor with OIS. Crank the ISO higher, you've got a better grain pattern to work with, you get better detail, you get better capture, higher bit rate, and we're eventually going to use some kind of software cropping anyway. The main benefit, the main stabilization you see on a Galaxy does not come from hardware OIS. What you're impressed by is software cropping into the frame and matching the, the gyro movements of your hands to smooth out that video. Samsung does it really well. OnePlus does it better. It's better. <laughs> All right. So the better photo in setup one, phone B. The better setup in, in setup two, phone B. Both of those were the OnePlus 9. Now, I don't want to make it sound like there's a trend or something, but you know, I'm just, I'm just saying so far, two of the hardest tests that we could throw for low light photo and video have both gone to the OnePlus. So let's get back to some images again, uh, moving on to setup number three. Now this is a night mode shot. So both phones have the ability to over scan and brighten up an ultra dark image. If, if you've ever, if you've ever seen any of my, um, camera deep dives, the setup that I'm showing you here is again, it's lit by one really small street lamp. It's a very dark scene. I mean, you can't, you can barely see these trees in the viewfinder if you're shooting a regular photo. So the night mode performance here is, is impressive from both. Um, let me get back into the slideshow. So this is phone A and this is phone B. Let me go back and forth, phone A, phone B. And then I'll leave it on the side by side as you tell me which phone you thought was from each, which photo you thought was from each phone. <laughs> A DCNL twist. They're both from a Sony. <laughs> now this one's harder. Now this this one this one definitely is a bit more of a challenge. Uh, Dave Burns is saying A is the one plus. Simon says uh, Hypno uh, B is the one plus. Um, a lot of folks are saying A, and I would agree. I think A is the better exposure. I know, I know a lot of you are watching this as some kind of compressed stream, but even when I'm blowing these photos up on my own, I think A is the better shot. And in this situation, A is coming from the Samsung. Um, when you really drill down into the pixel level detail, both are pretty close. Um, the, the giveaway for me on this, and, and again, if you, if you watch this from the 4K version of the video, you can see it a little bit more clearly, uh, but it's up in the, in the stump um, at the top of the frame. Um, I wish I could show you where my mouse cursor is, but you know how there's like this slice of one of the, uh, the tree branches is cut off and it's kind of a stump. Um, 
this is one of the situations where the higher ISO on the OnePlus makes that look a little bit more watercolory. So I actually feel OnePlus loses in this showdown because they're trying too hard to make the image brighter than it needs to be. Because like if we look at the difference between these two shots and the, the sort of shadow detail in the bark on the Samsung, we could probably kick the OnePlus down about a quarter stop, maybe a third of a stop. Um, it, it's, it's, it's pushing that image brighter, which means on a phone without OIS, what it needs to do is accomplish, it, it needs to base its image scanning off of a much, much higher ISO. And, and I feel it's one of the, the consistent criticisms I've had with the OnePlus cameras is that they tend to meter a lot brighter than they need to. Like the OnePlus 9 Pro is definitely guilty of almost always being a full stop brighter than it needs to be based on the camera's own metering. So this is an example where I feel like Samsung's metering saves the uh, sa saves the comparison between a Galaxy and a OnePlus. Again, comparable pricing, I don't know that I'd, I'd buy one phone or the other off of some of these shots. We're talking worst case scenario, low light performance. But the one thing I will point out, um, because OnePlus is using a much larger sensor and the, the difference in OIS is maybe a half stop, what I think is kind of interesting is that capture took almost seven seconds on the Galaxy S21. So to get that night mode photo, you've got to hold still for like a six count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Try and hold a phone camera as still as you can for six seconds, all right? I mean, I'm kind of practiced on this stuff and it, I've got my technique. It's locking my elbows to my rib cage. It's taking that exhale. Like if you've ever shot firearms, how you squeeze the trigger on a firearm versus tapping into the shutter button on a camera. And then you hold steady for six seconds. That exact same capture took three seconds on a OnePlus 9. A larger image sensor can soak up more light per second, even if it doesn't have OIS. OIS isn't magically making the sensor and aperture larger on your phone. OIS is just helping you smooth some of those little shakes. But if you can cut your capture time in half and end up with a brighter image, then something else is happening here. It's a smarter burst from a pixel binning sensor that has more surface area to soak up light. I just feel like OnePlus kind of stumbled there with their post-processing and their metering. Not necessarily the technology, just the end result was a little OnePlus-y. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, nice try, OP. Better luck next year. All right, um, we've got, uh, what was that? That was number three, that was night, night mode. So, so far, if you've been keeping track, it's been, uh, OnePlus has been Bs. So for one, two, and three, OnePluses are Bs. From Heike, uh, by the way, one, does switching to manual mode help the situation on Samsung? If I've understood correctly, just switching to manual mode has a positive effect on image quality. That is a much more complicated conversation, but in what we're talking about right now, Setup one was captured in manual mode. Setup three was captured in night mode. It's, it's always about finding the right tool and the right setting for the right job. Like I wouldn't want to rely on an overscan uh, image stacking process for capturing action, right? So night mode doesn't help you if the whole point is to freeze a subject that's moving quickly. That's an overscan to try and apply more light. So it really isn't one global, this is how you get the good images. Um, it's, it's more learning enough about your camera that you can anticipate where it's gonna struggle. And once you figure out where it's gonna struggle, you can, you can change up what settings you're using to highlight the strengths of that camera. Every tech reviewer out there is really well-versed on the strengths of iPhone and Samsung cameras. 
very few take the time to figure out what the strengths of an alternative brand might be. And that's that's what's sad is because you miss out on the, the more well-rounded conversation. So back into some photo samples. This next one is an auto HDR. This is not a night mode. This is letting the camera decide in your main auto what it should do. And if you were paying attention during the video segment, you should be able to immediately see which phone shot which image. So uh, back into the slideshow. So here is phone A and here is phone B. And once again, phone A, phone B, and now I'll go to side by side while I take a drink of water and check my posture like Pakistan and Aditya Anil are asking me to. Which phone shot which shot? A is on the left, B is on the right. <clears throat> okay, Casio saying A, uh, Chris is saying B, and they say that B is better. Uh, Raymond is saying B, Simons is saying B, My Tech Review is saying B, uh, Gabaletta is saying A, Al Spockley is saying A, Loki Ted is saying A, and Aditya Anil is saying A. What do we know about the lenses on each phone? All right. Simon says, Hypno, the lens flare is making me rethink this. So uh, OnePlus has a better lens. Both, uh, all of our larger sensor phones have some issues with kind of a foggy flaring around light sources and high contrast situations. So if you're looking at the lamp, you'll see that there's this kind of hazy glow as the light is kind of uh, getting amplified by a longer exposure or by a more um, an image stacked, uh, a stack of image exposure. Every lens has some compromises. We have these larger camera, smartphone camera sensors. We've got these super wide apertures that we can't control. We can't stop down um, a smartphone camera. So all of them have some issues with fringing and flaring, the rainbow streaks that you'll see in some nighttime photos. Every single lens has an issue. But the one critical advantage of a OnePlus over a Galaxy is internal reflections. Samsung's look super distracting as every light that's in a nighttime scene gets it hits the lens, bounces around inside the lens, and then ends up as another pinpoint light source in your frame. So when we look at this, you can see this soft kind of glow on the left, but you see this hard-edged, super-defined, immediate ghost reflection on the right. So if you're paying attention to all of the qualities of photography, not just what gives me the best colors, then photographically speaking, OnePlus is starting with a more distinct photography advantage in lower light conditions. The, the light sources in your shot are not going to be hard, crystal clear defined reflections. I can't tell you, this is huge. Every single one of the larger sensor phones that I've reviewed, uh, Galaxy Ultras, uh, LG V60, even my precious Xperia. In fact, the Xperias are some of the worst for some of those internal reflections. I've got that butterfly shot, and you can see this hyper crystal clear optical defect of what the sun reflecting inside the lens can look like. OnePlus, it's not there. So we can look at some of the individual exposure tweaks between these two shots, but OnePlus again is producing the brighter overall image. Image clarity is pretty close between the two if I were to do some kind of pixel peeping 700% zoom, but Samsung is much, much darker. Are, are you ready? Ugh. I just can't believe in the Samsung shot, like all those shadows are like super crushed. Oh, Shadow Crush is the worst. Yeah, it can't resolve as bright of an image because it has a smaller sensor. So look at the background, the detail and brightness on the reflecting light on the walls. 
the ability to pick up more of the image and more of the detail along the brick. Shadows are not instantly lost on the shrubbery <laughs> off to the side. And OnePlus's image processing is more contrasty. So even working with a contrastier image processing setup from the OnePlus, it is still putting out a brighter image with more detail and more information as we get into the shadows with less internal lamp reflection. I understand why someone might like the shot from the Galaxy S21 better. That's not my bag. I really do feel aesthetically OnePlus has delivered the better overall shot auto mode to auto mode like it's close it's really close and like i said i can understand why someone might like the samsung better aesthetically uh computationally and uh photographically the oneplus image to me is superior there's 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 i, I really don't feel like there's a contest there <laughs> Dave Burns, the galaxy captured a spooky ghost orb. 1010 for ghost hunting. <laughs> um, Aditya Anil, the whole internal reflection situation, do they pop up only in nighttime photography with the light sources in frame? Um, you, you won't see them as clearly in brighter overall scenes. The reason why you can see them so clearly at night is because of the contrast. So much of your frame is dark, and then a pinpoint of light is going to draw the eye, and I find that to be very distracting. Um, in daylight, the bigger concern tends to be those streaky washed flares. You probably won't see a lamp reflect as directly when so much light is hitting the frame. It's probably just going to get washed out. Technically, it's probably there. Uh, practically, you're not likely to see it. Uh, but that is one of the situations, like if you're trying to shoot a portrait from a OnePlus, because of these larger sensors, you really do need to, to pay attention to the angle of the camera if your subject is backlit. So if the sun is behind your subject, um, as you shoot into the sun, very minor changes in the angle of your composition will make a huge difference in whether or not a streak of sunlight is flaring across your subject's face. That, that, to be, that becomes the more critical concern. It's a larger sensor, so you need to compose around that kind of uh, lens compromise. It's still a, a problem on a Galaxy, but because it has a smaller image sensor, it's a little bit less of a problem. That being said, it's a slightly smaller image sensor, so I like backlit portraiture <laughs> from the OnePlus 9 better than I do from the Galaxy. Um, last one. Oh, we're getting to the end here, folks. So this is the one that I goofed the most on. Um, this image of a lock is shot nowhere near any lamps. Again, it's kind of like that tree shot where if I could show you the viewfinder, the lock is barely visible through the viewfinder of the camera. And so this is a night mode shot. This is another long exposure plus image stacking over scan to try and make something in near blackout conditions as bright as you can make it. So um, let me cue this up here. Oh, whoops. Oh no, did I not? I think I might've goofed on the, uh, the, the layout for this, hold on. Again, I'm doing this live, OBS. Yeah, okay, I've gotta move these up just a bit. One second. That's a little bit better. And then, oh, that kinda of helped. Okay, good. Uh, it might mess up. Nope, the final composition looks good too. Okay, so uh, this is phone A, and I, I had it angled too low. And this is phone B, and I feel like this is the better composition. But again, what we're looking at, I'm focusing on the M in the master, in the master lock. Phone A, phone B. Phone A, phone B, and then side by side. So obviously the composition is better on phone B, but what we're looking is the exposure for focusing on the M in the master lock. Which phone took what, which image? Uh, Aditi is saying A is the one plus, Casio is saying B. Excuse me. Dave Burns is saying phone A. Uh, Squishy Man is saying A. Simon Says Hypno is saying B. 
Um, Paul Pori saying, I feel like I'm testing my new glasses. <laughs> Which one's better? Uh, A or B? A or B? Um, Al Spockley is going A for the OP. Gabaletta saying B for the OP. And this is the one, again, because I kind of goofed on the composition, um, totally fair. Like this one, there's enough difference in the background information that that could also explain some of the changes in exposure. But I'd say they're kind of evenly matched here. Um, the, the setup as we're seeing it right now, uh, phone A, the, the, the higher composition looking at more of the street behind it is the OnePlus. So the OnePlus is on the left and the Galaxy is on the right. Now, we're so close here, and I'm talking about like the most obnoxious kind of pixel peeping, but the lines in the lock are just ever so slightly clearer on the OnePlus. If you look at the little bright splotch that's um, around the chain link shadows on the Galaxy, it looks smearier and does not maintain the horizontal lines of the lock. That is such an extreme pixel peeping analysis that I feel it is irrelevant to the greater overall photography conversation. If there was any opportunity to show where optical image stabilization could make an advantage, it could, could display a clear advantage over a phone without OIS, it's in test shots like these. Now, if you'll pardon the anecdote, what I thought was hilarious. Um, so I put up this video and uh, obviously there's lots of commentary. You can go through and see the comments. Lots of people talking. It's so crippled. How could OnePlus do this? They're just grifting now. Uh, how dare they, uh, you know, they cheat their customers. What's going on? One of the hilarious ones, and I really didn't pick up on this. I shot these photos. Someone slid into my Patreon private messages and just started roasting. How dare I? How I am obviously the worst kind of Samsung hater purposely misrepresenting these tests. And it was so clear to them that I was because in the lock shot, he can clearly see a lighting accent on the side of the lock. If you look on phone B, they were convinced that phone B, because it was the better composition, the, the, the image on the right, it was the better composition. And if you look very closely, you can see an edge light on the side of the lock on phone B. That means at some point during the capture of that, that photo, a car a block away, the headlights were, were filling in a little bit of extra lighting detail on the side edge of the lock. That's, that, that proves that my comparison here was totally rigged and obviously I am just trying to hate on Samsung and I, I should never be trusted for any type of gadget commentary. That little extra edge lighting on the side of the lock was their proof that I was rigging this competition in favor of the OnePlus 9. So then I replied, that phone was the Galaxy. I showed you a photo from the Galaxy S21 that got a little bit of extra illumination against a poorer composition from the OnePlus 9. Oh, well, you should work harder to make sure your comparisons are more fair. No apologies for all of the terrible words, for calling me dishonest, for calling me a shill, for calling me a hater. No, no backtracking on any of their absolutely acidic and toxic uh, assessment of my ability. Just, you know, like, like, just work harder in the future. You should just be more like, just, just like do it right next time. This is how desperate someone is for their team to win. <laughs> this is how toxic the conversation has become 
in trying to do a reasonable comparison. So, so there's a, there are a bunch of smartphone reviewers and influencers out there that are just regurgitating the spec sheet and washing their hands of the conversation. Because let me tell you, when you really do the work, you're not rewarded for it. Instead, you just catch all the grief because you're not towing the line and you're not repeating the same truisms and you're not saying the same things that another larger reviewer did. These types of comparisons take me days to work on. Like I've got to go out and walk around dark neighborhoods at night and like shoot the same samples. All of these were shot on different days and I feel like I did a reasonably good job on four out of the five test setups recreating that frame from memory. And now you tell me what other smartphone reviewer out there by memory can match the frame of his test setups, camera comparison to camera review, to camera review, to camera review. And I'll tell you, none of them can. None of them have ever set out to show you the same kind of long-term evolutionary photography comparison. It's really easy to go out there and just sort of blindly like, I've got two phones and snap, snap, and, and like make that your photo comparison. Go back to that same spot a week later and match your frame. And I don't know that there are many who are up to that task. So I'm gonna toot my horn, because I did that pretty well. And out of four to five of those test setups, I missed one. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I, I saved a screenshot of, of that patron. Someone paid money to slide into my Patreon DMs to say the worst things about the, my character that they could think of only to be completely wrong. So that I'm, I might frame it, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, uh, what to do with the office and where we might live next and we might need to move soon. I think that's going on my wall, not, not my YouTube play button, that, that image of someone absolutely trying to savage me while they were 100% 100% wrong. <laughs> so, um I feel I feel like I've done my due diligence. <laughs> Gabaletta, you should just tell us which picture is which so we can nitpick the other brand photo to make them look bad. Again, Every single time you see a head-to-head -head comparison, there, there's an obvious conclusion that I feel is trying to be uh, achieved. There's an obvious winner that um, a reviewer is trying to show you. And every single time a reviewer actually does the work to closely match frame, exposure, and, and uh, sort of environmental settings, to put these up as, as a fair comparison, um, the, the, the results are much harder. So in this showdown right here, there's, there's, not, there's, there's not an easy winner. I prefer the OnePlus 9 for the larger image sensor. It gives me a little bit more room and range to work with light, but it will arrive with a grainier output. The, 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 the immediate need to extend a higher ISO means better image detail and clarity, but it also means a grainier or more textured final image. So I can't definitively say that's better. Someone really might want even a darker version of a smoother, better noise reduction scene. And in situations like that, the Galaxy S21 is the better fit. But if we're talking about exposure, if we're talking about brighter images, more easily freezing action, even in lower light conditions, and obviously superior video, like obviously superior video. Um, in, in auto shooting to auto shooting, it's the OnePlus 9. If you tell me you really need manual video controls, then you need to buy a Samsung, hands down. Like that's easy. But this whole time, we've also been training techies to complain about, well, who has, who, who has the time to dial in like manual settings? I, I don't want it to dial in manual. I just need it to just work. It should just work. The OnePlus 9 just works. The Galaxy S21 needs a lot more handholding to achieve the same effects that you get out of auto on a OnePlus 9. These are at the most extreme ends. You know, so if you show me bright daylight photos, they're both gonna be generally comparable, which makes sense considering the pricing is pretty close. 
we should expect a Galaxy Ultra and a OnePlus 9 Pro to outperform an S21 and a OnePlus 9. That's a no-brainer. But at around 750 bucks US as the full MSRP, and this is before sales or carrier deals, I've got performance here that's totally in line with Galaxy S21 and iPhone, iPhone 12. I'm not conflicted in the slightest. And in fact, there are some significant hardware advantages on a OnePlus 9 that help it punch above its price tag and go toe to toe with phones like an iPhone 12 Pro. Because let's not forget, an iPhone 12 Pro uses a much smaller main image sensor than the 12 Pro Max. And the ultra wide sensor on the OnePlus 9 is larger than the main sensor on the 12 Pro Max. <laughs> and the main sensor on the OnePlus 9 is larger than it's ultra wide. That is a physical and tangible benefit where optical image stabilization cannot, in all shooting situations, make up the difference. Especially once computational post-processing gets involved, it's not only closer, there are some significant advantages for the OnePlus. So, <sighs> Dave Burns, techies eat soldering paste. <laughs> it's not the sensor size, it's how you use it. <laughs> and from McCorcoran, this isn't, this isn't really about OnePlus, it's about competition. You will find this tone of coverage anytime a competitor releases a flagship other than Apple or Samsung. Again, if you're talking about the core consumer experience, there are still plenty of people that I would recommend a Pixel over a OnePlus 9. You're telling me you want that kind of casual, snapshotty, point-and-shoot kind of vibe? OnePlus 9 is great. A Pixel 4a is probably going to do you just as well. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, from my tech review, I guess the whole idea of calling a phone pro as a reviewer show why they should be entitled to the word pro. If they do the work, then they can talk about it. Um, this, is, this is increasingly why I'm getting... I stay so sarcastic and so cynical and so confrontational with my, my commentary. It, I mean, literally just today, another video came out from someone saying, like, I'm not going to buy OnePlus this year because uh, look at the OnePlus 9. It doesn't even have OIS. And it's so easy to say. And this guy has like 500,000 YouTube subscribers. It's so easy to say. Look at the OnePlus subreddit. Oh, no OIS. I, I mean, even my OnePlus 7 has OIS. Yeah, the OnePlus 9 is going to merc the OnePlus 7 in 95% of the showdowns I can demonstrate. If I go back to my photo samples on a OnePlus 7 Pro, it's not close. It's not. So it's fine to feel okay about your OnePlus 7, but to go out and trash a phone that you obviously haven't shot on because some other tech reviewer said, oh, but it doesn't even have the OIS. And they can't even explain how the OIS makes a difference means that you're, you're not really into tech. You're not really into verifying these claims. You're, you're not really participating. You're, you're, just, you're just an echo chamber for whatever marketing is going to be most popular in that moment. So I am very, uh, very excited about um, this image sensor tech. Uh, obviously, you take a OnePlus 9, and I think it competes phenomenally well at the $800 and lower price tier and manages a few victories over phones that are more expensive. And then you can take that one step further with a newer, larger sensor and optical image stabilization on a phone that's a bit more expensive. I don't see any, any problems. I am not conflicted in the slightest at recommending a OnePlus 9 in this price tier and it, when we're comparing MSRP to MSRP. I think it's golden. I think it's doing great. Um, if someone has a higher budget, you can get something nicer. That's a no-brainer. But right now, where we're at, this is solid. So um, I feel like that's the perfect place to start wrapping this up. <laughs> 
Uh, in Paul, yeah, exactly. OIS is nice to have, but you have to have quality software to back it up. And and sometimes it's not even you know whether or not the phone can utilize it. It's more what are you expecting to do? Because I think a lot of people have have blurred their understanding of OIS based on camera sensors from four years or five years ago. Um, you know, if we look at like the 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 peak of OIS. I believe it was LG V20, where one of the major marketing points was LG incorporated a lens with a higher degree of movement. It, it doubled the range that the lens could swivel to compensate for your hand movements. If you didn't know what you were doing, you didn't get a smoother video. You got a way wobblier and jelloier video. If you knew what you were doing, you could kind of compensate for that and just the hardware OIS could keep a, 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 a floatier, but a smoother frame. Then the Pixel came out and just wrecked everything. You know, it just, just steamrollered over everyone because it was all gyro enabled electronic image stabilization. And from that point on, every impressive stabilization that you've seen has been some form of electronic image cropping. It's not been the hardware. You, you see the effects of that way less than you see the software punching into the image, cropping the frame, and then compensating for your movements based off of the gyro readings. That's it, that's the gig. So to pretend otherwise means you fundamentally don't understand photography and you fundamentally don't get this tech. And that's fine if all you wanna do is have some kind of fashion branding channel about technology, but it does a huge disservice to people that might care about the real practical use of this stuff. And I think that's a shame. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna wrap this up now. Um, and again, for those of you that were that are listening to the audio version of this after the fact, um, there's gonna be a standalone video and, and you can catch the replay too if you wanna catch the replay on twitch.tv slash some gadget guy. And I'll cut this up so that you can kind of see these comparisons more directly. and. And, and uh, if you feel like joining that conversation, you can too. But I would also highly recommend just watching the original video uh, and seeing if you can pick out which phone was which. Because if it mattered, if it were really that important, I feel it would be very clear and easy to identify which phone had OIS and which phone didn't. And uh, I feel like what we've accomplished today is at least some clearing of the air that one spec in a vacuum does not an entire camera system make. So, um, oh, and Dave Burns also hitting it up with a with a subscription on Prime. They've subscribed for 12 months now. I, thanks for, for jumping in, uh, David. I really appreciate that. So uh, be on the lookout. There's gonna be a ton of commentary. I'm gonna be doing a companion video uh, for the OnePlus 9 camera. So the OnePlus 9 Pro deep dive is only on the OnePlus 9 Pro. And so I'm not gonna do a full deep dive on the OnePlus 9. This is gonna be more a commentary video talking about some of the differences I see. Um, and then, so that's gonna be out this week. Uh, I've got some more audio kit. I really gotta get back to some of my, uh, my audio loves. So I've got the Ultrasones and I've got the Pinnacle P1s. I've been sitting on videos for those for a while. So we're gonna get back to some headphone reviewing. Cause I'm telling you, I've been having some beautiful experiences uh, listening to some high quality gear. And, uh, you know, like I said, I just, I got to come back to my love or else I just get real amped up and it's all just drama videos about how much YouTube sucks. Oh, and Paul Purry. Oh man, Paul, uh, dropping a bunch of subs to Biggie, to John, John Iron Three, uh, Lori Elf, uh, Tech Zero, um, Amrion One Noisy, Doomer, Javier, uh, Dario 3005 and Falls 3 Agent, Paul, Gary, uh, Dave uh, just recently upping his subscription. Everyone, thank you so much. A a a any type of support, of sharing, of conversation. Um, it means so much to, 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 to have like a little crew, a little community of people that really do care about these kinds of conversations. So folks, uh, I want you to have an amazing week with your technology. I want you to do awesome with your tech. I want you to be awesome with your tech. I'll catch you back here next week for another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. Be well. Take care. We're, we're so close to figuring out the new normal. I love it. We're going to get back on track. 
but now is not the right time to make any dumb mistakes. So look out for each other. Take care of each other. I'll catch you back. I love you all.